Let's uh, pray and then we'll get started with our Bible study tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together and receive from your word. Father, I know that the Holy Spirit is truly the teacher of the church. And so, Father, we give him leave here tonight to do whatever he would like to do in this service. We just surrender ourselves to your guidance, to your direction, Father. And we just thank you for that. Thank you that the word of God goes forth in power and unhindered. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, let's... Uh, Open our Bibles to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. And the title of the message tonight is Follow After God. Follow After God. And what I want to do before we even really get started directly into the scripture is basically have us ask ourselves a very important question. And that question is, what do I want, you can put your name there, <laughs> what do I want more than anything else? Everybody has something that, as, as you might say colloquially, you know, turns your engine over. It really gets you going, gets you excited. Uh, most of you know that for me it's technology, computers, I love that, I love to mess with it. Uh, I've got a new tablet here in front of me that I really am getting excited about. It's a Nexus 10 Android tablet and it's really neat. Uh, but for me it's technology. For some people it's cars. For other people it's fishing. Some people like to go golfing. Uh, you know, I know a guy at work, he loves to ride his bicycle. He puts on the stretchy weird looking outfit and he has a 10 speed bike and he's, you know, got all this accessories and all this he spent tons of money on and he literally rides every literally I'm not kidding you here every spare minute that he's not at work he's out riding uh, he even said there was one day that because of the weather and everything he could only get in a 15 minute ride but he did anyway uh, you know that's his thing okay that's what excites him as he told me today, he says he doesn't know if it's the endorphins <laughs> that are produced because he's exercising or what, but he just, he just gets excited about it. Well, everybody's got something that's kind of their thing, but here's what we need to do spiritually is put God in that position of that thing that you want. And when I say thing, you understand I know God is a person, but in terms of goals, in terms of desires, in terms of our heart, He, God, needs to be number one. Now we know that intellectually, we I'm sure know it spiritually, but a lot of us haven't made that transition over to God truly being number one. You know, again, if you were to ask any Christian, is God number one in your life? Oh, absolutely. Well, okay, that means certain changes need to be taking place in your life. You know, one would be, in the case of this particular guy, God would come before his bicycle. And he'd probably go, oh, well, yeah, uh, uh, that's right. But is God really before his bicycle? Is God really before my technology? See, these are the questions we need to ask ourselves. And they're personal questions. They're not something necessarily that I can see by looking at you or that you can see by looking at me. You know, a lot of people would look at uh, a minister and say, oh, well, you know, God is obviously number one with them. Well, yeah, you'd think so, but is he really? <laughs> Let's look at Psalm 42, 1. Uh, now, this is a psalm of um, David to the chief musician, Maschil for the sons of Korah is the the header on this but the psalm starts out in verse 1 as the heart or deer heart is a term for deer as the heart panteth after the water brook so panteth my soul after thee O God my soul thirsteth for God for the living God when shall I come and appear before God now the psalmist here says we assume it's David I, I, I'm pretty sure that's right says here that 
his soul is after God to the point that it's like a deer panting for the water. In other words, the deer is thirsty, the deer is looking for water, that's its primary focus, its primary goal. That deer wants water. Well, in the same way, the psalmist's soul, my will and emotions, wants God. That's how we have to be. We have to look at a pursuit, if you will, of God as the number one priority in our life. Now Psalm 63 verse 8 has another really important uh, uh, message for us here concerning how serious this is in terms of seeking after God. You know, it's one thing again to say, well, I, of course I'm after God, I want God in my life, but how much? <laughs> verse 8 of Psalm 63 says, My soul, once again, my will and emotions, followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. My soul follows hard after thee. You know, I did a little uh, studying of this phrase, my soul follows hard after thee, and it, 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 the, the meaning here in the Hebrew basically is talking about a pursuit running after uh, not letting anything stop you. And that's how much we're to be after God. Now what we're talking about here, and again the title, Follow After God, we're looking at following God. Now, on the surface you talk about following God and it's like, uh, well yeah, you know, I follow God in that I do what He wants me to do, I say what He wants me to say, and that's all important. But it's the desire side of this that I'm really looking at. How much do we want to follow after God? How determined are we that we want to follow after God? Let's look at a little study here of, um, let's see, this is a, uh, well, let me read the scripture first, Luke 17, 23. Luke 17, 23, And they shall say to you, See here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. Here Jesus is talking about in the last days, which I think we can all agree we're in the last of the last days. In the last days, there are going to be those that say, I am Christ, or he, you know, he's over here. And there's going to be a public cry, particularly among churches, to say, Follow after him, that's the Lord. And this is what Jesus predicted, prophesied, was going to happen. And there have been instances of that throughout history. There have been those who stood up and said, I'm Jesus, and I've returned. And people have followed them. Matter of fact, there's a guy living right now over in, I think it's Russia, somewhere in Russia, that is saying that he is Jesus, and people are following him. Uh, so there's always going to be those kind of people. But here Jesus is saying specifically to his disciples, when they say, see here or see there, don't go after them, nor follow them. The word follow is what I want to look at. And this word follow is a Greek word, dollback. It means, um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, wrong definition. It is dioko, dioko. It means a prolonged and causative form of the primary verb to flee, which is kind of counterintuitive until you get into the meaning of it here. Uh, it means to pursue, in other words, it's a running after. Let's put it that way. When you say to flee, it sounds like you're running away from something. This is running to something, but it's to run toward, to pursue, by implication to persecute, to ensue, to follow after, also translated press toward, and uh, it's the word that's used here to follow, to follow. But see, when, we, when you use the term follow, it sounds weak. It sounds submissive. I'm following, you know. This is not talking about following in that sense. It's talking about pursuing. It's talking about your soul is panting after this like the deer pants for the water. You are uh, putting this person, this cause, this thing, whatever it is, absolutely first place in your life, and you're going after it full throttle. You are running hard after this, whatever it is, this thing. 
So Jesus said, don't do that. Don't run after these false Christs. Philippians 3.12 says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. And again, this is that same Greek word, meaning to pursue, to run, to run toward. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So, I haven't already attained, I haven't already arrived, I'm going to run after God. I'm going to go for it. And really, that's kind of the, euphemistically, that's, that's kind of what I want us to think of here. Go for it. Put God first place and run after Him. With all your heart, with all your strength, run after God. Now, Thayer, concerning this definition, Thayer is a Greek expert, Concerning the definition of this word, he expands on it and says this. To make, to run, or to flee, to put the flight or drive away, that's part of the meaning of the word, to run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing, to run after, to press on, to pursue, can also mean to harass, to trouble, to persecute, to mistreat. All of that is ways this word is translated. But the last definition they use here is the one that I think is the best for what we're looking at. To seek after eagerly, to earnestly endeavor to acquire. Earnestly endeavor to acquire. Again, how determined are you to follow after God? Is it, well, I go to church on Sunday. I go to church on Sunday night. I go to church on Wednesday. I'm passively there, and when pastor teaches, I'm going to listen. Are you really going for it? Every moment of every day, your mind is occupied with what can I do for the kingdom of God? How can I continue to grow spiritually? How can I be involved more in what God's doing in these last of the last days? I mean, let's face it, there are things going on, and we just heard today, as a matter of fact, in the news, that the Supreme Court ruled that the Defense of Marriage Act is now null and void. And I told Blinda this afternoon, I said, you know, you mark it down. I'm going to go ahead and do a little prediction here. You mark it down. This day will mark the beginning of an increased persecution on Christians. Because true Christians are going to stand up for the Word of God and say, the Bible says. Okay? I don't care how you feel about any particular person or how they act or what they believe or what they do or whether they're homosexual or not or whatever. Doesn't matter. The Bible says. And people are going to look at Christians that say, yeah, but the Bible says, and say, see, you're homophobic, you're evil, you're despicable. And the, the persecution level will start to increase. And there's going to be a lot of Christians that instead of standing up for the Word of God and what it says, are going to start shrinking back and saying, well, uh, this is getting a little too hot for me, this whole topic. I'm just going to avoid the whole issue. I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm just going to let the world do what they're going to do and just that's it, you know, and, and basically shrink back on it. Now, here in North Carolina, we had a vote. And we passed a, an amendment to the Constitution of North Carolina that said marriage is defined as between one man and one woman, period. Okay? That's what we did. Well, California did it. Same thing. Made an amendment to their Constitution. But part of what the Supreme Court ruled today was that that, even though they passed it, even though it was legal, even though everybody vote, voted for it, and even though they changed their Constitution, that doesn't count. King's X, no, can't do that. Now, if they can do that in California, which all the politicians there are cheering and saying, yay, this is what we wanted, doesn't matter what the people want, this is what we wanted, and we're now going to start issuing marriage licenses again to same-sex couples. Well, same thing could happen in North Carolina. Now, the question is, this is just one example of many, I'm just using it because it's in the news, do we just sit back and go, oh, well? Or do we say, no, the Bible says. Now, here's what's going to happen. We'll do that, but the persecution level is going to start increasing. 
It's going to get hotter and hotter <laughs> to be a Christian. Harder to do, to make a stand for the Word of God. we got to be ready. we got to be so following after God and His Word, we don't care what the, the circumstances or the consequences are to that kind of stand for God. This is just the days we live in. That's why this is so strong in me to get this message out because it's important that we're following after God and Him alone. And that means God and His Word. Not what the world says, not what the, the television's preaching to us, not what the magazines and the news media and everything else is preaching to us, but what does the Bible say? That's what's got to be absolutely the predominant, preeminent thing in our life. And that's it. Now that's going to get tough, but we've got to be ready for that. And again, just by way of prediction of what I see happening, there's going to be such issues as this to deal with. Now that this is passed, the next frontier for these activists to take on is, well, I want to get married down at Faith and Victory Church. And so they're going to come and they're going to say, Pastor Ed, I want you to marry us. And Pastor Ed's going to say, ain't no way. <laughs> you know? And he's going to say, look at the Bible, look what it says. Here's Romans chapter 1, blah, blah, blah. And they're going to say, you are discriminating against us. Then they take the church to court. Then the pressure comes to bear. You have to perform this ceremony because to do otherwise is to deny them of their rights going to come. There's going to be somebody that's going to pick up that banner and run with it. Now sadly, I know this for, again from recent news media, when the vote was coming up about the marriage amendment, there were churches. I use that in quotes. Churches and pastors, again in quotes, that stood up and said, we need to right this great wrong and make sure that our homosexual brethren and sisters can get married to one another because that's fair and just and loving. And these are pastors and churches saying that. There's a big one over in Winston that I'm thinking of right now that has a denominational name on that church. And yet they're saying that. And they're saying, you know, that a large part of their congregation are homosexual and they are speaking for their community. Well, once again, Christians who stand on the Word of God are going to look at that and say, uh, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. And where's the persecution going to fall? On the Christians that are selling out or on the Christians that are standing with the Bible? It's going to be the ones who stand for the Bible. And part of that is, and let's just be honest, part of that is these are the last days. You know, we need to make stands and we need to do everything we can legally and quietly and peacefully to protest anything that comes against the Word of God. But let's be fair, these are the last days and these are what we expect to be happening. But for us personally, we've got to keep ourselves from falling into traps like, I hate to say it, some of these pastors like the ones over in Winston who were standing up for gay rights. Well, obviously, they have fallen completely away from the Word of God. As Pastor would say, put Ichabod over their church door. <laughs> the glory hath departed. That's what Ichabod means. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the Word of God. They are completely outside of the Scriptures at that point. Now, again, I don't have anything against them personally. These pastors, these churches, whatever, I... I Fine. But why call yourself a Christian church? Why call yourself... Why, I mean, they probably would even get up and say, well, of course we believe the Bible. Really? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And that's just one area. I'm using that as an example. I don't want to belabor that or stay on it very long, but I'm just saying one of many things that we're going to see in these days that's going to cause us to have to dig our feet in and get serious and not just float on by, you know. Uh, the days of kind of a namby-pamby, do-the-best-you-can Christianity have long passed. 
We've got to really start getting serious about things in the Word of God. All right. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed, this is that same word, to pursue with absolute strength and vigor, the Gentiles, which followed not, okay, so that negates it. They weren't following after in the sense of pursuing after. They were not interested. They followed not after righteousness. That's right standing with God. But they have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Why? Because they received the Lord Jesus Christ and were made righteous through what Jesus did on the cross. Not because they worked for it, not because they were running and pursuing. They didn't even care one way or the other. They didn't even know they needed to be made righteous at the time. But they received Jesus Christ and they attained righteousness. So obviously it's not of works. I mean, that's pretty clear. But look what it does say. But Israel, which followed, that's that running, pursuing, strong running, after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, or in other words, take it out of the King James, why? Why is that? They were really pursuing righteousness after the law, but they didn't attain. The, the Gentiles, they weren't pursuing righteousness, but they did attain. So why? Because they sought, talking about the Jews, they the Jews sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They wanted it to be by works. They wanted to be able to say, yes, I have attained to righteousness. That's not how it works. You do that by faith. They didn't know that. They didn't understand that. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Whosoever believeth on Jesus shall not be ashamed, but whosoever tries to attain unto their own righteousness, yeah, they're going to be ashamed because they're not going to attain to righteousness. So here you got a case of the Gentiles that weren't pursuing after God, but they got it by faith. And then you've got those who were pursuing after God, at least they thought so, but there wasn't any faith in it, and so they failed. So, obviously, the way you've got to do this is by faith. So don't look at it as, wow, boy, Dr. Bill is just beating us up tonight. <laughs> That's not my intent. My intent is to strike you thinking that we need to start applying ourselves and applying our faith to following after God, to really pursuing the things of God, putting Him first place in everything in our life. All right, let's look at 1 Timothy 5, 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Now this word follow is a different word than the pursuing and running after. This word means to follow after, but to tread in one's footsteps or to imitate his example. Some men's sins are beforehand going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. In other words, they're following after people who are leading them in a wrong direction. But they're not pursuing, they're not running after, they're just treading in their footsteps. Okay? And this is what I see happening to... A lot of Christians, unfortunately, these days, they get a hold of a teaching or a teacher or a doctrine, and they follow in that person's footsteps. They track right along with them and get into error because they're listening to error. If you listen to error, that's what goes down into your spirit, and you start believing the error. And I know, I've even known people who told me this, uh, and, and believe me, I go back a long, 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 long ways in terms of things that have been out there being taught. And there's been all kinds of weird doctrines that have come along through the years. And I knew this one guy with this one particular doctrine. And uh, he told me at the time, he says, now, now don't get me wrong, I don't believe this. I just want to go to the meeting and hear what they have to say for themselves. And so... You know, you think to yourself, oh, well, they just want to study uh, this error in order to be able to teach against it or something like, you know, something like that. Because this was a guy that was pretty strong. He was a pretty solid guy. Well, he went to the first meeting, 
And then he went to the second meeting. And then he went to the third meeting. <laughs> and then he comes back saying, you know, they do have a point. And he starts telling me about these weird doctrines. And I'm, I'm not talking about kind of slightly off doctrines. I'm talking about completely out of the wild, squirrely, freaky doctrines. You know, I mean, things like the Holy Ghost is a female because you got God the Father and the Holy Ghost the Mother and Jesus the Son and it's the Holy Family and blah de blah and on and on and on. And I'm like, well, what about where the Bible says the Holy Ghost is He? Well, uh, translation errors and blah, blah, blah. I mean, he starts making excuses for this weird doctrine. So I said, uh, hello, this is, you are going down the wrong path. And so I sat down and shared the word with him. Now, this was a long time ago. I was in college. This is how far back this goes. And uh, he saw the error of his ways, repented, and got straightened out. Praise the Lord. But what was he doing initially? Well, I'm just going to go check him out. And then I'm just going to go and hear what they have to say so I can counter it. And then it was, well, you know, they have a point. And then it was, you know, this may be something we need to look into. He's tracking with the teacher, following along, one step at a time, imitating and following that example to tread in one's footsteps, it says. That's how people get off. It's easy to do. And they don't even know they're doing it. And that's what happened in this particular case. Now, let's, that's the negative side. Let's look at the positive side. I want to get back to the positive side. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. This goes back to that word follow, meaning to run and pursue. Go after it. 100% whole hog. Let us therefore follow, pursue, after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. So, we've looked at don't follow after the negative. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be those who pursue false doctrine. So what do we do? Now we're looking at the what do we do? We follow after the things which make for peace. We follow after the things wherewith we may edify one another. Edify means to build up, like the word edifice, like a building. We're building up one another together. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 11. But thou, O man of God, well, that's us. We're men and women of God. Amen. Thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow, there's that word, pursue, run diligently, follow after righteousness, that's right standing with God, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. And the word meekness there is a really key word, and every time I see the word meekness, I mentally substitute the word teachable. Because we automatically look at that word meekness and think it means a weak, passive, oh, I've got to just shrink back here and, and not be very demonstrative, demonstrative, and that's meek. Meek like a mouse, some people say. That's not Bible meekness. Bible meekness is, I don't care what I personally believe. I don't care what my opinion is. I believe only what God says in His Word. It may not even at the time that I see it in the Word, it may not make a lot of sense to me in the natural, and I may be having a hard time with it, but it's in the Word, so I'm going to believe it. That's meekness. Meekness is, I lay aside my own rights and privileges of what I'm going to think, and I believe and, and think only what the Bible says to believe and think. You know, there's a lot of Christians, like, again, I use that example of, of pastors that are, are saying, you know, we ought to take up for the homosexual cause. I am sure that in their heart, in their mind, they think they're being compassionate. They think they're being open-minded and all kinds of positive things. They're trying to show the gospel in a good and new and modern light. They've got all these things that they're thinking are positive. But when you get right down to it, whatever your opinion is, I don't care if you think, well, this is really, this is a matter of, of inclusiveness. No matter what you may think about all that, doesn't matter. What really matters is, what does the Bible say? 
And you look at what the Bible says and you say, I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what even what I think. Meekness says, I'm going to follow after God wholeheartedly. Pursue after God. Pursue after what His Word says. And by doing that, I don't get off in error because I'm sticking so close to the Word of God. Even if I don't understand how this is fair, you know, or whatever. Whatever term you want to use. Doesn't matter. The key is, what does the Bible say? So let's look at it again. Righteousness, right standing with God. Godliness, being like God. Meaning, we think His thoughts, we live His way. Godliness is really being like God. Now, I look at it this way. Children tend to imitate their parents. We're talking about, you know, dad comes in from work and he kicks his shoes off. What does the little boy do? He goes over and puts his dad's big old shoes on and clomps around in them. He's imitating daddy. And we look at that guy, isn't that cute? Well, he's imitating his father. Same way with us. We imitate God. We look at what God does and we imitate him. That's what the Bible says. Book of Ephesians. It says we're to be imitators of God like dear children. Now, actually, the King James says followers of God as dear children. But the word there is mimetes in the, in the Greek. It literally means to imitate like a mimic. You know, like you would get up and mimic someone and, and try to speak in their voice. Same kind of thing. We're imitators. We're mimics of God. We're, we're following after God. Being godly is being God-like. So that's what we need to be doing. Faith. Well, we know something about faith. Praise the Lord. Operating by faith. Speaking the word of faith. Hallelujah. Love. God is love. He doesn't have love. Although, obviously, being love, <laughs> he is loving. You know, that goes without saying. But it's not that he has it. He is love. So we follow after God. We follow after love. Patience is not, I'm going to lay here like a rug and take it. That's not patience. Patience is to be consistently the same way all the time. Absolute consistency. And see, that's the thing, again, that people get irritated about Christians that follow according to the Word of God. They're always saying the same thing. <laughs> They're always just talking about what the Word says. I mean, come on, can't you be open-minded? I, I, you know, I don't need to be open-minded because I'm right. <laughs> the Word of God is right. If I'm staying with the Word, I'm right. <laughs> Amen? Now, the world may say, well, no, you're wrong. No, that's what the world says. I know what the Bible says. And my absolute final authority has to be the Word of God. All right, so... Covering it once again, 1 Timothy 6, 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore, here's that word again, follow, pursue diligently. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith we may edify one another. Notice this is the second verse of Scripture that says that we're to edify one another. We're to build one another up. Now, why is that so important? Because the world's going to try to tear you down. The world's going to try to tear down believers. They're going to try to tear down you. They're going to try to tear down your brother, your sister, and the Lord. So if anything, we ought to be lifting each other up. Now, unfortunately, Christians have had a reputation for tearing each other down. And a lot of people say, you know, the worst persecution I get is when I come to church. <laughs> well, that shouldn't be the case. But unfortunately, in the past, it's been that way. Now, praise the Lord, it's not that way here at Faith and Victory. At least that I know of. You know, we're here to lift each other up, help each other, and, and edify one another. But I have been in churches, and I've seen churches where it was... See what they're doing. You hear what they did last week? Blah, 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 blah. Everybody's talking about one another. No. We're here to lift each other up, to help each other. If somebody has a need, you go help them with that need. Somebody needs, you know, I can't, I'm not good with fixing, you know, houses and things like that. But if somebody's house got hit by a tree and, and you're a carpenter, you go over there and help them, you know. I mean, we're just there to help. We're there to, to, to lend an, a hand and, and, and aid. We're there to minister to them any way we can, help them out. And that's the way it should be. 
but even more so spiritually. The term edify here means to build up. One of the things we do to build ourselves up on our most holy faith is praying the Holy Ghost. That's, that's a building up that occurs when we pray in tongues. Well, in that same way, we ought to be reaching out to other believers and building them up, helping them, helping them get through things and, and minister to them in, in whatever way we can. Now, I've got a few other scriptures here. I'm actually debating whether to get into this because it is a, a completely different, it's like a different tangent. You know, when you study a particular word or phrase in the Bible, you come across some that are kind of, okay, that's good, but it's not quite on the thought we're, we're talking about. So let me just mention them, mention them in passing and not spend a whole lot of time on them. Judges 3.28 says that he said unto them, follow after me. Now this word follow is different than the other words we've looked at. Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the uh, fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. This word follow means to run after, to put to flight. The lexicon says of it, to be behind and to follow after or pursue. In other words, you're, you're behind somebody and you're following them. To pursue, to follow after, also can mean to be pursued, but it also means to chase, to chase. So it's similar in the meaning of what we're looking at. But it says, follow after me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Psalm 119, 150, the same word that has a similar meaning, but this is Hebrew, of course. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from thy law. We would put it this way, they're far from the word. They follow after mischief and they're far from the word. They're pursuing diligently, but they're pursuing the wrong thing. And that's why I say, you know, I just throw that in there as just a, a little additional thought, because I wanted to stay over on the positive side, that we're following after the things of God. We're following after God. As it said there at the very beginning, as the heart pants after the water, so pants my soul after thee, O God. What I want us to look at here is that we're to follow God and His Word more than anything else. Put everything else aside. Now, you know, God is not against you enjoying golf. He's not against you enjoying fishing or even me computers. <laughs> he doesn't mind us having good things and enjoying them and having fun and all that kind of stuff. But when push comes to shove, you need to be able happily and readily to lay all that aside and go after God. And it's going to be even more important, like I said, in these last the last days. It's just the way it is. It's the times we're living in. It's a time to get really serious, to get a little bit more introspective, I guess, is maybe a good word, way of saying it, of where our heart is. What are we putting first? What are we thinking about and meditating on and and, and putting first in our life. That's, that's really the thing. I want us to kind of challenge us to do that tonight. Is to think about our own lives and think about what can I do to be more after God and His Word and His ways and His things. You know, we have all kinds of opportunities. We got things coming up, as a matter of fact, here at Faith and Victory Church in the near future, I believe, that are going to be exciting and they're going to be challenging and they're going to be time-consuming <laughs> for a lot of us. We're going to have to give of ourselves, not just our finances, but ourselves and our time in order to do some of the things that I believe the Lord has for us as a church. We can and should be reaching a whole lot of people. And I'm not talking about just numbers in the seats, although that's, that's a good thing and that's important. I don't have anything against that at all. But I'm just saying I believe God's got some things for us to do, some callings and some uh, missions, put it that way, some missions that he has for us. And it's not necessarily all overseas missions. A lot of it is, is stuff that we're going to be doing right here in, in this country, in this state, in this city. But we need to be about that business. You remember what Jesus said? He said, I have to be about my father's business. That was his 
focus was to be about his father's business. Well, same thing for us. We need to be about the father's business. That means evangelizing. That means reaching. That means doing what's at hand to do. And we've got a lot of stuff that we could put our hands to do that a lot of other people, a lot of other churches don't have the capability, the background, the knowledge that we do. And you say, yeah, but we're a small church. Yeah, but we're a very capable church. We got a lot of people that have a lot of things they can do that applied correctly can be reaching untold thousands. So we need to expand our vision. We need to expand our dedication. And that's why I'm looking forward to, and, and again, I'm saying this kind of by faith. I haven't, I don't, I'm not privy to anything other than just what I sense in my spirit. But I think there's some things Pastor's going to be announcing. He's going to be giving us direction of things we're going to be doing as a church that we're going to go, whoa, can we do that? Yeah, we can. And a lot of it has to do with the, with the talents and capabilities we have here. That we can get some stuff done, get some things going that, you know, frankly, is going to shock some folks. That we're going to be able to accomplish it here at this church of, a, of this size. But we're not going to stay this size forever. We're going to grow and things are going to start happening, popping all over the place. Because I believe as, as, <laughs> as much as the world is coming against the things of God, there's going to be people that are going to just kind of get their fill and they're going to say, you know, I need to get with the program. I need to go with God just go all out. So it's, it's going to be that decision time. Do I go all out with God or do I just fall back and try to stay out of the way? Well, I'm going all out with God. I'll tell you in advance. So that's, that's what I'm saying. That's the decision that we need to make. That's, the, that's what, I, what I want us to start praying about and meditating on. What can I do to be more involved? even stronger than I've been involved. And, and you're going to find that your strength is going to increase, your dedication is going to increase, things are going to start happening in your life. All those things, you know, I was talking about how I love my technology, all those things that really excite you, suddenly you're going to have a whole lot of cool stuff just because God's going to start giving you stuff. And I tell you, it's, it's going to be exciting times and it's going to be times to rejoice. But it's also going to be some times where we're going to have to put our shoulder to the plow, so to speak, and get some things done. So I wanted to share all that with you. I just had this on my heart, been meditating on it, did a little study along these lines and, and saw some of these things and didn't want to spend a whole lot of time just, you know, go into a lot of stuff for the sake of going over. But I just wanted to bring these thoughts to you, let you start praying about it, meditating on it, and just hide and watch. It's going to be exciting what God's doing in these days. Praise the Lord.